Hey folks, welcome to the cabin. Today we're going to be looking at the Canon XF605. I'd like to do a deep dive here with an in-depth look at the camera and its layout. Not quite a review or a tutorial, but more of a long-form overview. I rented this camera to see if it was worth the upgrade over my XF400. It is $4,500, and that's pretty steep for me. However, after using both cameras to make this video, I'm seeing where the extra costs are justified. Looks like I might be saving up to pull the trigger on this thing. Let's start with a little history. In the 2000s, camcorders ruled the world for us common folk. The Sony VX series, the Panasonic DVX, Canon GL2, and X1H. These mini DV tape beasts were what you saw at weddings, behind the scenes in newsrooms, and the cameras preferred by documentary filmmakers. They were quick to pick up and hit record. They featured long zooms, good focus, both auto and manual, video specific image stabilization, and a slew of features missing from today's hybrids. Hand them to anyone, there was a good chance you were gonna get usable footage. The thing was, everybody knew the image wasn't great, especially compared to 35 millimeter but the logistics of film, cost, and the knowledge required to operate and output the image was impractical. Fast forward, in comes the Canon 5D Mark II, the camera that arguably changed it all. With a larger sensor and good glass, it meant your final output was more comparable to the images on the big screen. And since then, we've had an influx of technology building off that original platform. From cinema cameras to medium format hybrids, it seems like a fast paced technology war. When honestly most people watching the videos made from them can't tell the difference between the specs from 2010 till now. Camcorders are still being manufactured though. Plenty of people use them and the ergonomics have been getting refined this whole time. But they've been slow to grow in image quality and sensor size. In my opinion, there hasn't been a proper running gun camera that ties it all together in one package. With the ergonomics of a pro camcorder, the image quality of a hybrid camera, and the features of a cinema camera. However, now, I think we might have a contender. So here it is, the Canon XF605. It feels really nice in the hand. Coming in just at 13 inches. Six and three quarter inches tall. And six and a half wide. Measuring from this ridge to the edge of the lens cap. It's not a porker by any means. But sitting next to its little brother, it's got some girth. Weighing in at 4.4 .4 pounds versus 2.5. I'd say it's a good compromise being that weight can provide you with stable footage. And the length increase means you can put it up against your chest or on your shoulder, dad style, leaving you with the LCD in plain view. A big part of why I rented this camera is I wanted to see if my bag, the Shimoda X30, could fit it. And well, 
it's pretty tight with the medium insert but pop the lens hood off and it fits in there still enough room for camping gear so I can still travel light and not have to check a bag to fly the handle fits in the hand nice it makes a bigger camera like this easier to move around it can also help you get low to the ground for different types of shots or hold it normally and operate the three manual lens rings off your belly on the top of the handle an XLR expansion adapter and a cold shoe for the front for a light or a mic or whatever you want moving back you have a non variable zoom rocker with 16 speeds behind that is your customizable number 7 button stock setting is magnify to check focus next to it a lockable secondary record button and your menu joystick cancel combo this was really nice to rest the camera on your lap while learning the menus. A 3.5 millimeter mic jack and two Prestalock XLR ports, as well as pretty good inbuilt mics. They can run in two channel or four channel. Also housed in this corner with your mic line and mic 48 volt toggles. Jump to the opposing side of the camera. Brings us to a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And below your external audio controls with auto manual toggles accessed under the inbuilt cover. Rotatable audio level dials for channels 1 and 2 control. With the cover closed or open, you're able to access the audio status quick button, which shows you your main settings, and with the press of one of the two joysticks, you're able to have access to the quick audio menu page. Your main record button is off your right thumb when your hands housed in the strap. Another joystick cancel button next door. Nearby a USB A host and your first remote port, port A. Out all the way in the back is all your broadcast and media ports. These are a little above my knowledge base to be honest, but recognizable to me is a full size HDMI, SDI out, and USB-C. We'll slow this down for the rest of them because you know if you need it. The battery is a BP A30 coming in at 45 watt hours. Press the button on the back to show your battery percent with the camera on or off or on the charger. I found the LCD battery estimates to be quite accurate, but results may vary. If you need more juice, although pricey, there is a 90 watt hour option available. The small battery is kind of a pain to get in and out. As with all the switches and dials in the camera, the on off toggle has a nice premium feel. The little green button is a detent to prevent you from actually switching it on or off. The camera powers up quick, maybe two or three seconds till you're rolling. The three and a half inch touch LCD is bright, not too bad in the sun, pretty sharp at 3.5 million dots. It articulates in all directions. One neat feature is you can put the LCD away up 
and have an overall smaller package while filming. Gone with the old junk touch screens, this one's smooth as silk. Though the text is small out of the box, it can be pretty hard to press a function accurately. I was unable to find a text size increased in the menus. I'm sure there's one in there buried deep. Jumping you right into the camera's inbuilt playback. A simpler menu system. Recording formats are nicely separated and neatly organized. Long press a clip in the main index and you'll be able to play or display clip information. Or you can add a marker if the clip was filmed in H.264. Once playing a clip, you have nice smooth operation such as swiping between clips or scrubbing on its timeline, feeling more like a smartphone than ever. Checking out the viewfinder here. It looks big from the outside, but on the inside at 1.77 million dots, it's pretty far away from the eye and a far cry from Canon's top mirrorless systems. However, if you fiddle with the diopter, you're able to get a little more magnification out of it, and you're still able to see it clearly. I would call it pretty usable, especially on sunny days, with the massive removable eye cup. Here houses two SD card slots with a slot select button so you can toggle between cards on the fly. Make sure you have the card door shut or the camera will not recognize any SD card. I found cheap VG60 cards don't like H.265 but plays nice with the all intra H.264 high quality settings. A cheaper Extreme Pro VG30 records H.265 just fine though it has trouble in the all intro modes. Canon recommends a VG60 or VG90. You might want to get a nice one. This camera is equipped with a ton of different codecs and multiple frame rates. Its main codec is H.264, there is H.265 mixed in, XFAVC for H.264, and HEVC MP4 for H.265, both shoot 422 10-bit. This must be considered a world camera, because it has your continent covered with both NTSC and PAL. 24, 30, and 60 frame rates at 4K. Up to 120p slow motion in 1080, provided you're in the correct codec and frame rate. The all intro modes are supposed to be easier on the editor, but eat up card space. Long GOP codecs have smaller file sizes with limited loss of quality. And the H.265 option. The codec options are something that the 400 is pretty light on. 
It held up the worst when compared at the same data rates. For me, H.265 all the way, supposedly giving you the highest output for half the card storage. Canon said a big part of the 605 existing is the 705 is mainly H.265 and editing was a chore for their customers. The 705 was released in early 2019 and things have changed. Between then and now, we've had the M1 Max come out and they eat it up no problem and more video outlets are accepting it now. Right here I'm running a MacBook Air M1, the cheap one. It runs smooth with all the codecs inside. This is the free version of Resolve. I find I could leave it monitoring in 4K, provided there's nothing else running in the background. This video is darn near a terabyte of information in editing off a T5 external hard drive. I had few hiccups. This camera has 10-bit 422, shooting to what seems like endless picture profiles. With Rec. 709 normal, seven oh nine wide dynamic range, seven oh nine standard. Canon C Log 3, a proper gamut. PQ and HLG for your HDR. EOS standard. EOS neutral. and 11 custom profiles are able to be edited in camera and saved. This camera is equipped with a key lock for handing off to someone else maybe or so you don't potentially bump a switch when it's on the tripod. All switches are disabled except for the record buttons and if in manual your lens controls. Here's a infrared mode. It has a dedicated toggle that automatically switches your settings over for it to work. I find it slightly more powerful than the camera's highest gain setting and knocks down a bit of noise. But when you switch on the IR light for this mode, you now have some low powered night vision enabling you to get that shot of Bigfoot. The default is a traditional green picture profile, however it has an option to switch to black and white, which has a more pleasing tone to it, and makes the footage more usable. So for the main body, here's probably one of the main reasons you would look at a camcorder or a cinema camera over smaller buddies that produce a similar output image. Let's start with full auto. It's by far the best full auto I've used. It's more of a pure exposure control. Leaving uh, your lens features and codecs and color profiles alone. This means in a pinch you can shoot C-Log3 full auto. All exposure controls can be monitored, whether in full auto or manual. This is another thing that's lacking from its cheaper siblings. Auto gain control is a feature missing from the XF400 as well. It's a huge Achilles heel 
and a welcome upgrade on the 605. That's how I've learned to run and gun on mirrorless options. Using it is almost an advanced auto. You can set limits in the menu to keep your exposure safe out there. As well as toggle between ISO and gain. Note that base ISO and gain works almost independently of each other. ISO will go automatically in high sensitivity mode and gain limits are set more modest. I find myself staying in ISO being a language I've learned in recent past. In case touchscreen controls aren't your thing, the traditional low, medium, and high gain switch is located just below. They can individually be adjusted within the menus. Your auto white balance toggle is located just above the manual white balance controls. In auto, it seems reliable, and you're able to control its response time within the menus. It's very accurate, even adjusting tint as you pan around. With options A and B, you're able to have two saved custom settings provided by the manual white balance button to the right if you do the white paper thing. Switch it to preset, it enables the LCD touchscreen functions giving you some control but with the added bonus of a quick tint change. In the menu, daylight, tungsten, and Kelvin are options in your preset for the preset. The shutter speed mode toggle is just to the right of the white balance preset. Press it over and release to adjust shutter, shutter angle, clear scan, and slow shutter. The only menu option has to deal with shutter increments and you can adjust it from a third of a stop to a fourth Outside the menus is where the control is. Toggle the switch and adjust the LCD or press the function button and scroll through with one of the joysticks if your eyes in the viewfinder. Endless external control. This is one of the things the heavy price tag gets you. Everything is laid out thoughtfully, and if you feel differently, you're able to customize 11 buttons on the camera. Every customizable button has a correlating number. On the left side, 1 through 4, 8 through 10. Top handle, just below the record, you have 7. On your right hand, above the zoom. On your index finger, you have 5 and 6. And the last on the front, near the three rings, number 11. I'll scroll through the menu to give you some ideas what you can move around. Moving on, we have a menu access button, the other being on the top handle. The nice thing about these premium cameras, it could nearly be operated without pressing them. However, at the end of this deep dive, we're going in. Starting off with the function button, press this and see an orange box appear and provide the settings are in manual. You're able to adjust your white balance 
your aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. Toggle between them using the function button itself, pressing repeatedly, or the one of the two joysticks. This is helpful if you're running the viewfinder and the LCD is closed. The SAS button shows you how you have the camera set up at a quicker glance than rifling through the menus. You can even take a look at where your custom buttons are assigned to quickly. A nice touch is when you exit and later enter back in, it stays where you left it. Down below gives you three screens to toggle between the LCD and viewfinder. With two being completely customizable within the menus as well as an adjustable border to try to free up some screen real estate while monitoring stats. Moving left you have four more buttons. They are pre-labeled but also custom buttons. 1 through 4, all having opposing dots rising up to try to train your finger on their location. Starting at the top, we have Powered IS. This is a handheld tripod mode. Best used in standard IS. Speaking of image stabilization, this camera might take the win. It is a huge selling point for me. With its fixed lens, you know it's optimized to work in conjunction with the body and processor, and it shows. Standard has a wonderful handheld look, not letting through any micro jitters or warpy corners. This mode is best for panning and zooming on the fly. Dynamic has a slight crop, so we know it's digital, and it helps out a bit more on the wide end. It's definitely not gimbal-like walking, but once again, the end results has the right amount of shake and little to no jitter. I've noticed that pretty much all hybrid cameras with IBIS give really smooth footage on certain situations. For static handheld shots, sure, they do great, but put some motion in the image, like trying to follow around a subject. The image jumps around and wobbles. This is where the 605's lens, smaller sensor, and processor are optimized to work together, and they really start to shine. Leave your tripods and gimbals at home. The buttons below, peaking and zebras and waveform monitor, all toggle on and off your LCD. All can be modified within the menu for more customizability. There are two peaking presets that allow you for color change and gain and frequencies. Increase or decrease? They're able to be switched from 1 to 2 in the LCD assistance function menu. Note the button only toggles peaking on and off. The button does not toggle peaking 1 to 2. That has to be done through the LCD. Here's the zebra button. It simply turns it on and off. But within the settings on zebras, you're able to set 
a skin tone zebra and a blowout zebra. Zebras can be found also in the assistance function menu, allowing you to turn them off to 100 and both 100 and 70. Last on the column is a waveform monitor lacking in most hybrids, another on off button. In the assistance function menu, you're able to switch between waveform and vector scope. They both can be moved around the screen via deep in the main menus. The last button in the section is not customizable. It falls right in your thumb when holding the lens. It's the push auto iris. This simply is a momentary switch that adjusts your aperture when in manual. Press and hold. Watch your f-stop increase or decrease. The XF605 and 400 have inbuilt ND filters. This gives you more control in the daylight to fool around with exposure settings and potentially keep your shutter speed in check. It has a quarter, a sixteenth, and a sixty-fourth stop. And with the plus or minus button, it allows you to rotate them infinitely in either direction. What I'm getting at here is if the NDs are off, you can switch it to the 64th setting right off. If anyone's watching, film skateboarding or BMX, any of the action sports, and you've been waiting for an upgrade to your VX or HPX, I think this is it. It has safe margins for 4-3 aspect ratio, if you want that traditional look. But you're going to have to get a 58 to 58 step ring for your fisheye to work. It does fit under the mic though. Chances are you have a mirrorless camera for your fisheye anyways. Moving now on to the lens. I'm thinking the glass on this camera is another reason it's tipping the price scale deep into our wallet. One of the smallest cameras with a real three ring professional lens. It even hosts the red stripe telling us potentially it's real L series glass. The aperture ring when switched into manual has a real nice resistance. I can't imagine it moving out of place if it was in a bag or accidentally nudged. It spins forever with no mechanical stops. There is an option to set the iris limit in the menu as well as different stops and finer increments. Also you can change its rotation direction. Switch it over to automatic. and your aperture is adjusted with no stepping between exposure changes. Yes, it's a fixed lens, but as with the theme of this camera, it's optimized for this body. Jumping forward, we have the zoom ring right in the middle. Now for me, I really miss having a nice zoom range. This lens states 8.3 millimeters to 124.5 millimeters tight, bringing it into a total of 15 times optical, or a 25 to 382 full frame equivalent. With a one inch sensor, that's a three times crop. The resistance is just right for medium to faster zooming shots. Really slow zooms do seem to jitter a bit, but compared to the XF400, it's night and day. The way Canon implemented the zoom rocker was really interesting and really helpful. Press the zoom toggle, 
look over to the LCD or viewfinder and you'll see an animation of where your finger's at within the range of zoom. It shows you how much pressure you're applying to the zoom toggle to help you from overshooting or undershooting. So you're able to customize three separate user settings. with five different pressures up and down on the rocker, and those individual five can be adjusted from one to 16 in any direction, at any speed. Note you cannot use the zoom rocker and mechanical ring together. They work independently of each other. If you want more reach, there is a 300 times digital zoom taking over after the optical range is spent. This mode is for 4K. By my calculations, that puts the end of the range at 7,650 millimeters. Obviously, there's a quality loss after 382 digital cropping into the sensor, but I, f I find it to be usable at a certain point. This option is nearly seamless. Switch from optical to digital with a slight increase in speed, but its implication is one of the best, so I can't complain. In 1080, a similar feature with a 30 advanced option, claiming no resolution drop using the 4K sensor. In the 1080 advanced mode, you're able to zoom with the manual ring. This is even a smoother operation, finishing out at 765 millimeters. Manual focus. The ring is buttery smooth. The resistance feels like a million bucks. It feels like it has a slow start and a slow stop. So coming into a sharp focus, it helps you from overshooting. In autofocus, the XF605 has Canon's top of the line dual pixel autofocus. with face and eye detecting all the bells and whistles. With this camera's smaller sensor, the performance is arguably better. When tracking something, you're able to dial in sensitivity so if an object appears in the foreground, the camera is able to breeze by it, staying tight to your subject. There seems to be a lot of information about the autofocus uh, systems on this camera. It's similar to the XF400s, just slightly refined. But one thing I found that was really neat on it uh, that I used the whole time, when in autofocus and you end up with something in front of the frame that you need to focus through, just grab onto the manual ring in auto and you're able to rack focus into your subject. So after all that, let's address the elephant in the room, the one inch sensor. While I realize that plopping a full frame sensor in a camera like this could be an engineering nightmare, or maybe it's too expensive, or there's no call for it, it would still be really nice to see. But back to reality, in RAW or ProRes, one of my favorite images that I've seen come from a camera 
are those taken with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera original. And not saying this is everything, but the 1 inch sensor is slightly larger than Super 16 coming out of the pocket. And not that much smaller than Micro Four Thirds. I've noticed in C-Log3, both the XF400 and 605, ungraded, does have a 16mm film look to it, at least by my eye. A ton of other cameras out there have a higher resolution and have unbelievable low light performance. But generally, it takes a lot more to get that image to look as good in motion as the 605 with all its parts and pieces working together. So here's how I would sell it to myself. It's essentially a pocket original with a 4K image that shoots a nice smooth modern codec with a fixed 15 time zoom, a two hour battery life, decent audio, and the most predictable image stabilization I've used. So if I can ever shake the notion that a bigger sensor camera is better, the 605 would be my first pick. Marketing is a strong thing. We've all seen the iPhone versus full frame comparisons out there. They really mean it when they say it's not the camera, it's how you use it. The 605 makes it really easy to use though. You know, Canon almost should have marketed this as a 16mm cinema camera. So, please enjoy some raw footage from the 605 and a few other cameras thrown in for comparison. If you like this form of overview and swayed your decision on picking this camera up, or you're interested in any of the gear I use to make this video, please consider the affiliate links in the description. Also, I left a downloadable manual if you have more questions than answers now. If you stick around after the raw footage, I go through the menus just so we can see what's going on in there. Enjoy! Bring it back. Come on. Manual zoom ring going nice and smooth. Standard stabilization. So that whole time I had the autofocus in like a large area. Let's see if we can get this sucker to... Yes. 
So that's in small area. Yes. The small area rocks. Same settings, long GOP 160. The Fuji, same shot, 50 mil, or 35 mil, 50 millimeter equivalent. Uh, Eterna, dynamic range set to 100. But I have the contrast turned all the way down, I do believe. Come here. Manual focus.
Gani. So this is pretty much touching the lens hood and I'm at, it says about 55 on the lens, so that's 220 millimeter equivalent.
All right, bud. Let's go. Cool.